This is the Business Storytelling Show with Christoph Trapp. Name a top 20 storytelling podcast and a top 5% podcast globally. Christoph chats with thought leaders and experts to share tips and tricks that can help you tell your company's stories better to drive business results. Available wherever you listen to podcasts, live streamed on major social media channels, and part of the DB&A television network, available on most U.S. television sets and streaming on Roku and Amazon Fire. Here's Christoph with today's episode. Let's go. Let's go. That's right. How's everyone doing? Hey, thanks for joining me. Another episode here. Today, we want to talk about ethics in marketing. Now, interesting topic to me, because what are ethics? I mean, I think I know what they are. I'm just rhetorically asking for all of you guys out there listening. But marketing is interesting to me. And here's the reason why, because what are people doing? You know, they're converting people, they're, they're doing things to get you to do stuff. Um, and I'm trying to connect with people too, you know, but, but where's that fine line? Or maybe it's not a fine line. Maybe it's a very thorough line. But I was just thinking about that earlier. Somebody who shall remain nameless bought something, not on purpose, and they didn't realize what they were doing. They, they didn't read the prompts, I think. So is that the line to be unethical, to just kind of hide what, what people are doing when they just click along? I don't know. So, of course, what I did, I asked one of the experts to come on, Deidre Breckenridge. She is the return guest. She was on the show, I don't know how long ago, I didn't look it up, but previously sharing knowledge um, on here. So her latest book, Answers for Ethical Marketers, uh, is now out. You can get it on Amazon. Um, and of course, if you're watching on Amazon, it is the featured item in the carousel. So let's get this party started and let's talk about um, ethics in marketing. Let's go, so to speak. Deirdre, welcome back. Really appreciate you making the time. Thank you, Christoph. It's so great to talk to you. Thanks. So uh, tell us about, I mean, what's the definition? I'm a big guy and, uh, well, I am a big guy, but I'm a big believer in definitions. So tell us about what's an ethical marketer. Well, you might think that the ethical marketer is that marketer in the communications department, that PR person, but that definition has expanded so much because today everybody in the company is an ethical marketer. And it's so important that it extends to every level and position and to really focus on values and ethical conduct because of the communication that we have today. And I think the answer of, you know, everybody is um, everything. I think that's always true to an extent, right? Because everybody has to know the customer. Everybody has to um, you know, understand what why we're in business. I mean, if you don't understand some of those things, how do you do it? Um, but we talk about being ethical. I mean, what, what does that mean? Like, does it mean unwritten rules, doing what's right for the customer? Do you know? I mean, obviously, you don't want to break any laws, but um, I mean, is it a fine line or is it a line in the sand? Well, that's an interesting question. I believe that. When you are the ethical marketer, you are communicating with good purpose. You do it with care for your customer. There's respect, honesty, transparency, and you're operating under the do no harm. That's the ethical marketer. And certainly there are pillars of ethics and companies go to great lengths to spell out their values. And I just think it's really important today that it, it goes beyond plaques and what's in handbooks, and it really gets to showing ethical conduct. And, and that starts with the leaders of the organization too. Well, I mean, don't get me started on companies writing out their values because <laughs> um, I don't know if I have it lying around anywhere. Um, I do have it somewhere. Tara Hunt and her company, they put together uh, a little, almost a game to come up with your values and what you stand for. And and I told her what I stand for. And she said, those are all the safe words, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, the, that's, yeah, yeah. You, you want to sound smart. You want to sound whatever, right? Not arrogant or whatever. Um, but, but when I see most of these values, I mean, nobody says they want to, you know, break the law or nobody says they want right. to be 
a jerk, and then when you deal with them, they're a jerk anyways, even though it's not written down. Um, so, but it really, if it starts there, how do we how do we get people to write down what they can actually live up to? Well, first of all, I think that it starts with the professional, really. And this is important for students and young professionals to hear, as well as any you know, professional seasoned as well, that you have your own personal values. And values are your choices, what you believe in, what you're going to honor, and it how you're going to act. When you go to a company, you don't leave your own values at the door. You are then moving into an organization that has values and there needs to be alignment. When that alignment happens, it becomes a part of the culture. And that's when you start to see the culture demonstrating the ethical conduct. So I just wanted to preface that we all have a set of values and there's going to be times and situations, pressing situations where if your values don't meet what your company is doing, you might have to rethink where you're actually working. Yeah, I think that's that's a newer line of thought, I think, right? Like you, you don't check yourself at the door when you go to work. And of course now, you know, I mean, I don't go anywhere. This is where I work. And uh, the, the other day I was right. sick and my wife said to me, I said, I might stay home tomorrow. And she says, you mean go stay upstairs instead <laughs> of going downstairs. Um, but, you know, I don't check who I am when right. I go to work, right? I mean, I'm still, I still am who I, I still am who I am. Um, so I think that's, that's, uh, people need to remember that companies need to remember that. Um, yes, as and, well. and I, I recommend in the book, Christoph, that professionals do a 30 second test. It's almost, a, it's a challenge. We all talk about how when you get in the elevator and you're going to pitch your company in 30 seconds to the VC who's standing next to you. Well, in 30 seconds, you should be able to define what are your values? Because if you can define it, you can live with it. You can take it to whatever communication touch point at every crossroad. And ethics also, we have to remember, it's what you do when people aren't looking. <laughs> you know, it's not just when people are watching, but when they aren't looking as well. And that's all the time. Well, and of course, today, even if people are not looking, you might be on camera. Just, you know, fair warning, as we've fair seen. Fair warning. So, you know. What uh, so you wrote the book? What what specific? So when I wrote Going Live, you know, I definitely saw the need. Everybody's running out there doing a podcast, and I thought, good idea, but it's building a whole new network, right? So you should be live streaming your podcast. And now, of course, my podcast is now also on TV, believe it or not. Yes, so it's like I'm, continu you know, I'm continuously evolving it. But I had a very specific moment in time where I realized I needed to write that book. What prompted you? Do, did you have a moment like that where you realized um, this book is needed or what, what prompted it? So there's always uh, questions around ethics. This is a Q&A guidebook. And mm -hmm. when you start seeing a lot of questions being asked over and over and over again, whether it's around your blog posts, people are pinging you on Skype, they're asking you on Twitter, it's on LinkedIn, you know that this is a topic that is a pain point. And not to mention the fact that this book was written in the lead up to the 2020 election when media was out of control. There was a lot of polarization, fake news, bots. Um, it, it was during a global pandemic. Who do you believe? Who do you trust? Ethics really comes into play. So I think it was the, the timing of what was going on in our world, as well as the many, many questions that kept being asked. So writing a, a book is just a way to get answers to more people at the same time. Yeah, I can't disagree with you on that. And it, I really find it interesting. So I've preached for a long time that, you know, content marketers, they should really just talk to the customer success team and write about the questions that they hear all the time. Yes. And that's kind of what you've done here to an extent, right? Because you got like, I don't know, 70, 80, 90 questions that you answer in the book um, that somebody has asked, right? You didn't just come up with them. Exactly. So I always curate the questions. And it could be on virtual events. It, it could be anywhere. 
and I write them down. I usually answer them somewhere. And then the ones that are really popular, I keep track of. And that's actually how I wrote my other book too, right here, Answers <coughs> for Modern Communicators. It's no different. It was just a whole bunch of questions that kept streaming in and I was recording them. And before you knew it, I had a book, book chapters. They all fell into buckets and a publisher who said, oh, I love this. <laughs> so now we have two books in the series and hopefully we'll be moving to a third soon. Fantastic. I love that model. And, and, you know, if you're wondering if you're answering your audience's questions, what better way to know um, than them actually asking you, yes. you the questions? I mean, it's like, duh, we didn't just make it up in some committee meeting, you know, know. Where we're making up questions. That's, believe it or not, that still happens. So, well, that's okay. so great, Christoph, about live streaming. The fact that what you do, so many people can join and ask in real time. And those questions come from the people who care and they really want to know. So I, I think it's really good when your audience is asking and you're able to help out that way and answer. It is kind of interesting to interact with audiences um, online when you're alive because so I'm already, I'm doing all this production down here, right? And then I'm trying <laughs> to look at you up there and I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to have a conversation. And now I'm trying to keep attention on the comments. And then sometimes you have people who are just all over the place. So, uh, and, and I know you talk about what do you do when a tr somebody trolls you, you know, and, and that's, um, I mean, what do you do when somebody, and what's trolling? What's your definition? So trolling is a, somebody who is just out to give you a really hard time. It's someone who comes with bad intentions. They, uh, you're not gonna change their mind. They are the hater, <laughs> I'll say in quotes. And you have to be careful with trolls because they want to trap you in and then they bring all their friends and it's, <clears throat> it's an attack. And what we do in public relations, so I have a PR background, you monitor trolls, you make sure that you don't interact with them, we have clients not to, and eventually they move on. But the trolls, the bots, the fake news, we're, we're seeing a lot in social media that when it comes to the communicator's role and the role of people in the company, you don't wanna be perpetuating anything that could be negative, that isn't real, that is uh, not aligned to your brand. And when you do, you're not upholding your company's or, or your own values. And I don't know if this is actually trolls or not, um, but I've also noticed a group online or, or a group of people, I don't know if it's a defined group or not, but they always give you a homework assignment. So if I say, um, I create content in this format and, you know, instead of them just being jerks, they will say, but have you checked into the following, like literally giving me an assignment, right? And, and, and I feel very compelled to just ignore them. And I usually do because I'm not interested in taking their assignments. So it's kind of interesting. Um, how do you do it, especially on social media where, you know, I preach you should engage with people, but sometimes you just have to kind of ignore them. Um, what what do marketers need to consider to be ethical? I you know I grew up as a journalist um, for about a decade. Um, certainly, have been in content marketing and even I guess they all kind of overlap a little bit. You know, quite frankly, uh, PR for the last decade. And you know, I I like to think I'm ethical, but I would say my journalism career it came up probably more often than in my marketing career. Like where you talked about it, we actually used the term ethical. So what right. do we have to consider? How do we make it, how do we put it more top of mind? So I think considering ethics, it's about your decision making. And that is one thing that I'm working with executives when I do their media training or communications training. When people are under pressure, that's when mistakes happen. That's when you say things that you had no business to say, or you're not as accurate as you should be, or you come across not transparent when you really can only share a certain amount of information. So the first part of it is knowing that you should pause for a moment and not react so quickly. 
knee-jerk reactions get us into trouble. So that's a consideration. And it's also understanding that you're making big decisions through communications and you know what 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 are you basing your decision on are you looking at it that you have a, a moral duty to communicate a certain way is it more you know something is playing out and you want to do um, the most good for the most people so decision making is really important and I think that when you step back and consider this, it, it helps you to frame out, well, if I'm in this mindset and I understand my values, I'm going to take the time and to be more intentional. And that's where you get your ethical conduct. Companies that say, oh, we respect our customers, we respect our partners, but then you have, say, a CEO or a leader uh, on, a, on a show or, who, or some kind of live stream who comes across as impatient. Well, guess what? You're not upholding your values. It's a disconnect for people who are watching when you say one thing and you do another. And it really, it's all about your decision, how you're going to come across. So it's interesting you say that. I'd be interested to hear your, uh, your, your thoughts on this. Um, yes, I've noticed that too. And I think for most people, if they are jerks, it's mm -hmm. extremely difficult to actually not be a jerk at some point during a live stream. So I'll give you an example. Now, so now we do 27 minute shows. We used to do them much longer, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have a good conversation going, we just keep talking and talking. And if somebody is not a nice person at some point, I can guarantee it, it will come through for most people. And I've actually had people say that to me. They're like, this person was a real jerk. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of felt like it. Um, you know, because like Absolutely. they do, it's like mannerisms. So is it about training to just change your mindset? Or how do you not, how are you not a jerk? I'm, I'm totally oversimplifying. <laughs> so you know what I mean? I'm not a jerk. <laughs> that's, that's the question of the day. I, I wish I had the perfect pithy answer for that one. Um, when it comes to professionals, you're you're you have to put on your professional hat. And if you're upholding the values of your company, you're not going to get away with that for a long time. However, if it's a if it is your brand, but let's think about this. If that is your personality and knee jerk being um, abrasive whatever it is, if people expect that from you, then that's the way that you are. And some people like that. <laughs> so I guess what I'm trying to say is that we're upholding our brand and brand value, right? And if you have a certain brand, there are expectations that come with it. And believe it or not, that's why certain personalities can do things and not have to apologize. It's it's not expected from them. So I'm just going to say when it comes to being the jerk, people, and it's perception, people will recognize uh, someone for the way that they act, but some might appreciate it if it's built into the brand. Does that make sense? Oh, my goodness. Yes, it does. And that's one reason why we have such a not to go down the politic rabbit hole here, but that's why we have such a polarized country. Right. Because some people just um, they stick with their brand, whether um, whether it turns some people off completely, uh, you know, for a marketer back to the marketer side here, though. I mean, that's also I mean, the more you kind of focus in on your audience and the more you're, um, you know, you behave like they behave and the, the way they want to talk to you. I guess that's better. I still don't think it's very good to create a brand where people are just jerks and don't do what's best for everyone, quite quite frankly. But that's just I, my I opinion. Do no harm. I'm I'm right there with you. It's a do no harm approach, and that means everybody involved. <clears throat> so that that's where I stand with my values. Yeah, I agree. So let's talk about different channels. I mean, there's a multitude of channels, right? We already mm -hmm. talked about live streaming a little bit. Um, and, and how about all these different channels? How do I align um, being ethical across all of them? So aligning ethics, uh, let, let's talk about marketing, public relations. 
you have social media weaved into that. You have people who are doing your web work. Uh, maybe you have advertising programs. Sometimes it's looking at what's going on and where are the problem areas. That's first, because when there are bottlenecks and you're pressed for deadlines, things are getting tight, you're more likely to make mistakes and not have those bumpers and cushions that would catch something that might go out and maybe it's a miscommunication. Maybe it's something that uh, will be perceived the wrong way that uh, your audience would not appreciate. So finding the problem areas first is a really good way to be able to open up the channels in a manner that is more um, in, in line with your values and communication and shows your ethical conduct. So I say that that's step number one. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm always a big fan of looking at, you know, where do we focus? Um, where are the biggest problems, so to speak? And, and, and how do we move forward from there? Um, so, I mean, you make decisions all day long, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I was thinking about that the other day as a, as a content creator, even. I mean, I make decisions all day long. You know, sometimes they're pretty big decisions. Is this the right messaging? You know, even if you do a, a live stream or whatever, you still want to stay on brand to an extent, right? If you go too far off, at some point it's going to hurt you. But how do you, how do you work that in when people ask you to make potentially unethical um, decisions um, or, or take unethical actions? I know you talk about, for example, the inauguration from whatever it was four years ago, right? Down. Right, and the numbers. Um, I mean, totally inflated and, you know, I mean, how how can you push back? So if some executive comes to you and says, do this, and you're like, well, I'm the PR specialist, you know, um, three years out of school or whatever. I mean, how do you, what do you do? It's like, can you win that, I guess? So that's difficult. That's speaking truth to power. And when you're one, two, three years out, you don't have the experience to be able to say to something to someone, I'm going to share this information. You might not like it. <laughs> if you roll out with this, it's not going to benefit your the cause, the purpose. It, it will cause a rift with these people. So you, you have to lay it on the line, question it. If you know that your your boss is still going to say, roll it out or you're fired, I would say at the end of the day, if you know something is wrong or you're headed down a path that could lead to not just a slap on the hand somewhere, but some real damage because of the, converse, the communication you're sharing, and even moving into legal ramifications, you should walk away. Because at the end of the day, all you have is your integrity. And if you go down that road, that's not one that's gonna keep your integrity intact. Now at the same time, you know, you always wanna tr trust your ethics GPS, but you can question, am I perceiving this as unethical or is this really unethical? Who in my circle that I trust can I bounce this off of just to be sure? Because, of course, if you're going to step down, and executives step down in protest often, you want to make sure that it's your GPS telling you, and you've also maybe gut-checked it with a few really smart ethical mentors. Yeah, I think it's pretty hard for somebody who is early in their career however, to step down right over some, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's becoming more and more common. I mean, back when I started in my career, I never saw anybody um, leave a job without having a job, you know, and that, that is much more common. <laughs> I think times have changed. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like there's uh, more leeway today for younger professionals to stay a shorter amount of time and to kind of skip over to the next or be able to some side hustle and then shift, but it's definitely more common not to stay as long and maybe not wait for that next opportunity. 
depending. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. So some of the book, to wrap it up here, the last question, uh, perhaps, in the book, um, there's some of some some talk about, you know, when do you apologize? How do you rectify a situation? But to me, it seems like it's much easier to just like, you know, be ethical and truthful from the start as opposed to, oh, my goodness, I got to fix that. Um, is that, but then I'm also thinking about all the stuff communications people have to keep top of mind, you know, and they have to know and what they can't say and what they can't say and, uh, and whatnot. Um, how, how do people even do that? How, how do communications people keep that straight? Well, it's tough because when things happen, there's many moving parts. And sometimes, even though you want to be transparent, you can't because you may harm your audience more by sharing something too soon. And I think I gave in the book an example of working with the sheriff's department and you can't be sharing information about what happened at the scene of an accident when protocol is in play and families are being contacted and things playing out on social media just make it worse. I really think that when it comes to the apology Yes, if we all had our ethics hats on and we were not pressured and in the perfect world, we wouldn't have to say as many I'm sorry's. But I think today what ends up happening is we don't get to the I'm sorry soon enough. And sometimes there's the blame game and shifting the blame. It never works. It's so much better if you're a part of it to just sincerely and to do it in a way that goes through the channels that are necessary and do it with your heart. So it's not just saying legal words, we apologize for. No, you really mean it. You do it on video if you have to, and it comes across a lot better. Sooner is always better, saves time. I lost you there for some reason. Um, I think that's just on my end for some reason. Um, Deidre, thanks for joining us once again. Answers for Ethical Marketers uh, is now available. Very interesting discussion. Really appreciate you making the time and sharing your insights as always. Thank you. My, my pleasure. It was great to chat with you. That's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in. Please rate and review our show on your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to share this episode with your networks. We appreciate you. Until next time, let the best stories win.